Um, again, I'm Tom Grabowski. Uh, Melissa is actually having some internet issues, but she will be on Slack to be able to answer your questions. Um, but I'm going to give you an introduction to what you can do with machine learning and data science techniques within the Elastic Stack. So, um, so just my name is Tom Grabowski. I'm the product manager for the machine learning team within Elastic. Melissa is one of the developers I work closely with on, on the machine learning team. Um, for those of you that are new to Elastic, you know we really Elastic is the is the company behind Elastic Search, and it you know we consider ourselves the search company. Where Elastic Search is the predominant search you know, tool that that's used by many many organizations. I mean it's it's the most downloaded you know search utility search library um, application, and you know. Most organizations that I talk to already are very familiar with Elasticsearch and are using it in some sort of capacity for, you know, for example, like Wikipedia. When you go into your search box in Wikipedia, you're using Elasticsearch behind the scenes. You know, when you're using Uber to find out how close is a car to, you know, getting picked up, you're using, they're using Elasto, Elasticsearch GeoSearch. You know, dating sites, when they're trying to find a match, search for a match in your area that's similar, you're getting, you know, it's Elasticsearch in the background. Um, you know, image, when you're doing image search, you know, with Adobe, you're using, they're using Elasticsearch in, in the background. So many, many ways of using Elasticsearch and being able to, um, and many use cases. Uh, when we, we try to categorize these use cases in a few different areas. One is just your, your search tools, your search applications, adding search to any application that you're running is, it, you know, it, is a big part of our um, use case. But also like if you're looking at logs, you're searching logs or metrics or other you know, data for organizationally, you know, we call that observability. When you're using it to search for fraud or unusual access or how users are accessing your system, we call it Elastic Security. We have these tools and workflows uh, within our application. And, and you know, Elastic Search is kind of the core, but it's part of the overall Elastic stack that we deliver. Um, and it's a very modular tour. And when you think about Elastic Stack, is a, a number of open source tools um, with some commercial features on top of those as well. But, you know, if you think about Elasticsearch is, is kind of the heart of it. It's where kind of your storage and search and analytics layer. And that's where kind of the machine learning pieces that I'm going to be talking to you are built into Elast the core feature Elasticsearch. Um, and Kibana is like our window into the Elastic stack. It, you know, it allows you to do visualizations, reporting, explore the data, search the data that is in Elasticsearch. So it's kind of that visual uh, front end to Elasticsearch. And then our ingestion layer, which is Beats and Logstash. Beats is our kind of our agents for you to collect. There's hundreds of different types of architectures and, and ways to collect data, whether it's, you know, files or you're streaming data in uh, through, you know, Hadoop or, or, or uh, you know, many, many ways of like streaming tw Twitter feeds and, and, and syslog and uh, all, all kinds of APIs that you can use it for. And then uh, Logstash is kind of our, what we call our ETL tool where you can transform your data. You know, if, if you're enriching it with geolocation, um, for example, or DNS names or, you know, other ways that you might be uh, enriching that data before it gets sent to Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch is really just to think about it, it's just storing JSON documents uh, that we've been collecting, you know, via Beats and Logstash, it stores it, and then we can visualize that within Kibana. And we can do this all in real time. It's a very scalable system that you can have installed as, you know, I have it installed on my laptop. We have customers that are install thousands of servers that are running the, these as, as nodes across thousands of servers. Um, and actually, there, there's we can have different deployment options 
We have a software as a service we call Elastic Cloud. If you just go to cloud.elastic.co, um, you get to see like the actual full running version. Uh, and that same software that we run in Elastic Cloud, we offer at, you know, an orchestration for you know, if you're organizations running Kubernetes or or not, you know, we have our own orchestration tool called Elastic Cloud Enterprise where you can build your own private cloud with, you know, the the search and and, and data techniques that I'll be showing you today. Just to kind of give an idea of what this looks like, um, make sure you're familiar. If I go to my Elastic Cloud instance, I'm just going to switch over my my tab here. As I, I mentioned, it's just cloud.elastic.co. You know, you can sign up for a free 14-day license. I already have uh, a login, so if I just log into my Elastic Cloud, you can see I've got a couple of deployments, and these are clusters of, you know, and I can say how much data I want to uh, set it up for. If I real easy way to show you how to create a deployment, I can just uh, give it a name say what platform, what location. So I'm selecting my cloud platform. You know, if you have already have credits in these platforms, you can use them and set up the version. Uh, we have some templates for how you want to organize like them, but I'll just, I'll do, I'll customize it and say, you know, how much disk space and data do I want? Do I want to enable machine learning features? I might want to like add four gigs you can see what the actual price on the right hand side looks like. So just sliders that let you kind of configure your cluster of servers so you can can use it to, um, you know, for your own purposes, whether it's a search interface or, you know, you're looking at log data or you're, you're working on user information. And I can just go here and create a deployment and it will go through and just build these the software for me, give me my password, I can download that. Don't worry, I'll delete this cluster in a few minutes. So um, you get an idea, it's just that quick, that easy. You're filling out a form, you're up and running with an Elastic cluster. Um, so, and that's what you can do either in the cloud or if you wanted to run this software um, in your organization. You, and we actually have open source features where you can just download Kaban Elasticsearch and, and Beats, for example, commonly referred to as the Elk stack for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, but now, because we have Beats and we have other features, we, we refer to it as the Elk, or the Elastic stack, sorry. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of Elastic and very generalized. Now, I want to really kind of focus on the machine learning capabilities that you can use within Elastic. Uh, and and our, our goal in the, the machine learning team at Elastic is to take the kind of the common data science techniques and make and operationalize them. You know, what does that mean? That means have APIs, have the ability to roll it out across a cluster of servers and, you know, with, uh, the ability for a master node um, and the U UI to to identify which which cluster, which node in the server, you know, has the most resources to run the job. You know, you can programmatically run it. Um, a lot of the you know optimize it for for the uh, for being able to run across you know data that that is stored across a cluster of servers as well. So. Make it so that and you know upgrades and updates and everything work seamlessly. And that's our whole idea. Is you know a lot of the work behind machine learning is just kind of that workflow of operationalizing your models and making them work with the data that you're collecting. And and we want to take make that work easy and and robust. Um, and then the other part of that is simplify it. You know. I mentioned we have all the APIs, everything at Elastic is API first. So we have APIs that you can programmatically do all this stuff. But a lot of the customers that we work with, users we work with, we just want to give them a form driven workflow, like a web form driven workflow where they can add their data. They can, you know, um, create a, a model around it, use that model uh, on new incoming data. So, you know, really just very simplify that, that workflow. Um, that, that you do on a regular basis 
So you're not having to build this outside. And we want to make it as easy as possible for data that exists in Elasticsearch. So the whole goal is this, you know, for, for the data that you're already storing in Elasticsearch. Um, so, and when I talk about machine learning, if you ever go on our website or, you know, you watch any of the webinars, we've, we've done dozens and dozens of webinars around machine learning and Elasticsearch. We typically talk about two different areas that we focus on. One is um, kind of the time series anomaly detection, where it's a very focused use case of building a time series model and looking for anomalies within that time series model and being able to score those anomalies and present them um, to you so that you can do operational um, use cases off of those anomalies. The other one is data frame analysis. Uh, we, we refer to it as data frame analysis. This is where you're building your own models and then using those models with inference, you know, on the data that you're collecting. And I'll walk through each one of these, but just kind of from an overview, these we talk about these a little differently. One is very much a, a focused type of model. The other one is being able to construct your own uh, models themselves. Um, so anomaly detection, the time series modeling is something that uh, my group has been working on for 10 years of development. Uh, we have thousands of uh, users that are using it. Um, it's, it's really an unsupervised machine learning where we're building a pattern uh, based on the, you know, the trend or, or structure of the, the data uh, that we collect. So we use it to detect anomalies, outliers from a group, any rare events. You don't have to label the data at all we actually automatically do that and build the model. You can kind of see the visualization. We have nice visualizations where we show you what the model looks like and what the, the, the data that's coming in, how that compares to the model, and then we highlight any anomalies within that, that data or within that, um, that time frame. Um, and again, this is all built on top of uh, views, you know, APIs and a nice user interface. Um, we can use, uh, you can select features within the data to say when you get an anomaly, what features um, attributed to that anomaly. So it, it does a reverse analysis when it sees an anomaly to say what's happening at that time that could have caused that anomaly. And because we're building a time series model, we can actually use that model and forecast that out. So you know, typically a time series model, we're, we're predicting the next data point and, and then we're comparing the data that we received to that data point. Well, we can predict out many, many data points and see where is this model going. Um, so just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, if I go to uh, my Kibana interface, you know, once, once the, the cluster gets built, you get a nice Kibana interface. I can go in here and click on my machine learning tab. Um, in here, we have anomaly detection as an option. Now I've collected log data from my website, so the elastic.co website, and I'm looking at that uh, data within my system. I can just create a job for anomaly detection, and I might look at the, the beat that I used to create that data. Um, and we have many wizards, you know, you can look at single metrics, multiple metrics, you know, to population kind of job and, you know, categorization content. We can look at the text and tokenize the text, but I'm just going to do the most simple jet type of a machine learning anomaly detection job here um, for the data I've collected from our website. Um, so here I'm looking at about six weeks worth of web logs. Uh, I might want to say, you know, if I'm looking for the the IP addresses that have accessed our website, I, I want unique IP addresses that have accessed our website. We see we get a nice little trend of that data. Um, we can then click on next, give it a name, and validate that it's going to run, um, and then just create the job. I can create this job for historical data, like this data that I've collected from our website, or if I'm continuing to stream data in, it, it will continue to update the model. 
it's an unsupervised model, so it's constantly learning and updating it. Um, it's really just kind of aggregating. You saw a 15 minute bucket span. That just means we're aggregating the data every 15 minutes. So I'm just looking for unique source IP addresses every 15 minutes that have accessed the website. And you can kind of see as it's building, it's kind of building the model out. And some of the vertical lines are, you know, where it thinks that there are anomalies. If I just went and viewed the results, I can now see the data as, as i've collected it in you know it started building the model you see in the shaded blue area where it thinks the data is going to be by about the third week we say it takes about three instances of something before it really locks into the pattern so by the third week we notice that there's five weekdays and a weekend um, we lock into the pattern now our our software doesn't understand the difference between weekdays and weekends it just understands the patterns that it's looking at um and it identifies kind of where things are. Uh, and and we can see some of the dots here showing us where there's potential anomalies. There's a big one right in the middle here that I want to kind of focus in on. We can see that we had a big drop off in the number of unique users. This was actually a real event that happened on our website. What we it's a probability model that we're, we're building. So we're, we're looking at the probability of this data point being so far off the model uh, where we expected it. And so we it has a very low score for probability of, of likelihood that it's, it's going to be in that area. We were expecting about 14, you know, 1500 unique, you know, users at, for that time period but we only had 86 and we did have an outage on our website at that time. So, you know, we had an S3 outage where we couldn't serve up some of the, the images. And that that was one of the big causes for it. We can, we give it a description, you know, we can highlight kind of that, how unusual that is, but because that was such a low probability score, we then convert that to a severity score. How unusual is that probability compared to all the other data that we've collected in our model. And that's why you see a severity score of 97. We, the closer you get to 100 is, is, is the most unusual event that's happened in the data and in our data set that we've collected. And like I said, this is constantly updating, constantly continuing um, to build it. If I was at, uh, building more information, I, I continue to, to understand how unusual and, and it would you know, if, if we saw other drops like this, it would give it high severity scores. Um, now, we one other thing we can do here is just be able to forecast this data. So we we have a pattern. Maybe we want to forecast out where do we expect this model to be in the next 14 days. So now you can see in the yellow, it, this is where we expect it, that pattern to be. You know, if you're trying to plan some system downtime, you might want to pick a time period where it's at its lowest of, of unique users. Um, it, it's really, we, we've built the time series model, the, 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 the um, algorithms behind the time series modeling so that you can just use it. It's very form driven. All of this can be done via APIs as well. We have lots of customers that are are driving a lot of the data to their website via anomaly detection, via these APIs um, for whether it's for alerting, for uh, identifying key issues. Uh, we have customers that are doing it for, uh, you know, real time understanding, you know, their customers and when something unusual is happening in their application uh, that the customers are using. So, um, just give you, that was a very high level view of, of what you can do. There, there, there's a ton of more detail of how you can perfect and, and change some of the dials and add more metrics to the anomaly detection. But that was just a quick overview of anomaly detection, a model, uh, time series modeling software that, that you can use as well. And it's, like I said, free 14 day eval on, on our website. You can get started today. Um, I showed you how we learn, predict, and then score the data. Um, so that's time series modeling. Now I want to get into kind of that building your own model. You know, maybe you want to, there's a lot of reasons that a time series model work for logs and metrics and, 
Um, you know, we do things for, you know, taxi cab rides and transportation systems to identify if there's something unusual happening on the data that they're collecting. But a lot of times, you know, there might be uh, other ways, other reasons that aren't time series that you want to use to create your own model around. Um, and we do this in, in a lot of the different use cases we work with customers on. One is a search use case. You know, we have a built-in model that we provide with the soft with, with elastic search to do language detection. That's, you know, based on a language detection model that identifies what language people are asking questions in, and then can you can route that to the right translation service. Um, we also, you know, work a lot with customers that are using elastic search for relevance or, or recommendation engines. And, you know, you can score what are the other customers are doing, be able to build a, 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 a workflow and a scoring, uh, build a model around recommending um, certain products or um, entities uh, and the, the data that you're collecting. Um, from a security perspective, you know, we have a lot of customers that use our software for security use cases. One of the ones is, is like trying to identify like malware or unusual domains, malicious domains that are tr trying to access your system. One of the common uh, malware use cases to go out and, and send data to a command and control center. Um, and they use their own malicious domains. We can identify some of that data by looking at the domain names and classifying the domains as you know, suspicious or not. Um, we can also classify types of devices, you know, what types of devices are accessing your software application. From an observability use case, you know, we can build models around, you know, what are typical standard users or hosts or, or, or buying patterns and who is doing outliers, you know, is it fraud? Is it just that they're not accessing the software correctly or accessing the data correctly? We can classify alerts, you know, maybe there's the... Uh, something about the features that we're seeing from the alerts and be able to route those to the right team. And then there's ones that we use ourselves. There are, you know, we have a subscription service. We want to see, you know, what customers are likely to churn and how can we determine risk level. And I'm going to walk you through kind of how that works in Elasticsearch. Um, so, you know, typical methodology, you know, machine learning methodology. And this, I think I grabbed this from Google's training. Um, but, you know, it, all the way from problem to, you know, being able to use a machine learning model to infer. Uh, so your whole end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline, we can do that all with an elastic search and deploy it and put it in production use case. Um, you know, if we say, let's say what customers are likely to churn and, you know, the, some of the data I have is kind of tele, telecom, telephone data. You know, we might look at the raw logs of what, you know, the, the telephone data is and and want to know kind of what are the reasons, what are the features that we want to build a customer around and, and explain, you know, why they would want to churn. And churn means like drop their subscription. So it's whether they're, they're happy customers or whether they're, they're dropping their subscription. And if we can create, a, we'd like to create a model and then score our customers and identify which customers are likely to churn or drop their subscription. Now, the, the raw data is typically not in the format that we want. So we have to construct that uh, data into the format we want. So I'm gonna hop into the uh, user interface again, I'm back to machine learning. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to just use my data visualizer and import some sample data. So this is just a CSV file with customer information from my telecom company. You can see what that CSV file looks like. The software automatically identifies what are the fields in this data, how, you know, how many unique fields uh, are in here. And then I can just go and import it right in and, you know, I'll just give it a name and import that data right into Elastic. Um, so now that it's imported, uh, I've got some call records as well I've imported. So it just gives me like a really quick and easy way to, you know, view this data. We can actually 
um, drill into it and see, you know, the actual records themselves and what have I just imported. It automatically identified whether some of them are um, text-based or numerical, um, you know, state and location. So I, I've got a good set of, of, of data that I want to construct uh, my data set around. Um, so when I construct my data set, you know, one of the things is I've, I've got, you know, I've imported the customer information. I have another index for call information. Um, I want to combine those together and then transform or pivot. If you think about it like an Excel pivot table, you know, pivot around customer entity. So I can aggregate things like the number of calls that they've done. So number of records that I've seen, number of charges, how much is each each call been? How long have they been a customer? You know, be able to take information from, from different data sets and then build something like, you know, an aggregated index or a feature index I call my customer index. Um, so if I just go to my transforms, I've already done this uh, for the data set that I've built and I kind of, you can kind of see, I've taken the calls information and customer information and then built a destination index, you know, that, that combines things like phone number, summarizes call charges, duration, how many numbers have they dialed? Um, and I can do, you know, very complex aggregations, location and, you know, enrich some of that data to really get it into a data set that I want to evaluate and you know I can whoops I can get a little preview of what these look like so now I've for this customer number I've got aggregation of all the phone calls all the records that I have what are what are they doing and how much are they they spending on the calls so I've transformed my data into a focus model now I you know for the existing data set I might have a training data set for all those different settings. And, and I can take that training set and build a, a supervised model. Now, in my model, I don't know if you, you saw, but one of the fields was whether they've churned or not. You know, it's a yes or no field. Um, whoops. And the, the ability to have that kind of labeled data set allows me to create my testing set and create a supervised model around that. So if I go back to my um, machine learning tab, I can go into data frame analytics. I can create a job based on that churn data set where I've, I've basically constructed my data set. And I can, we have a few different types of configuration. If I wanted to look at outlier detection, outlier detection, builds kind of the clustering and scores the cluster and identifies what what from the features, what's the distance uh, and density of, of that uh, outlier from, from the clusters. Regression is if you're doing a prediction, you know, if you're trying to predict a numeric, you know, uh, out there and then classification, you know, for this, I'm doing a binary classification. Uh, we can do multi-class classification. Um, but this, these are just based on boosted tree algorithms, uh, you know, that have made it a you know, simplified workflow and, and form driven workflow. There's a lot of configuration and dials you can turn, but we try to make it again. Uh, you'll notice that these forms make it very easy to get started, but you can get very deep. So here I've got my data set. I'm going to say churn is the, the dependent variable I'm trying to predict. Here are the fields in the data set that I want to use all of them. I can in include or not include them. Um, and what percentage of the data do I want to use for training? I, I might say, you know, give me, use 90% and then I'm going to use the final 10% for testing against. So I can just click the continue. I've got a bunch of hyperparameters I can add to. Uh, and, and, and we show how much memory this is going to take to build this model. I'm just going to leave the defaults, give it a name, description if I want, give it a field name, um, and let's see if I All 
All right. Gives me error messages if I've already had one made in the past. So it's a nice, you know, if one gives you information as you're building it and you can go and it'll create that model for me. So it just goes through. Um, we can actually view the creation of the model. It's doing the analysis. Again, this can all be done via APIs as well, programmatically, but the UI is very easy to use, easy to build your own models. Um, and uh, the give you an idea of what the model looks like when you get done. We provide a, a level, uh, we have an evaluate API that gives you like scoring of the different models, how accurate they are based on the testing data set. We have a Confucian matrix that shows you here, you know, zero is, you know, is kind of, uh, is whether they did churn, one is, one is they did churn, zero is they didn't churn. And we show you based on the testing data set, you know, about 90%. Now I didn't do a lot of levers. I could spend a lot of time figuring out which features, um, you know, and, and querying the data, you know, and, and picking kind of uh, the features, aggregating uh, different kinds of features to get the best model. And the nice thing is the Evaluate API lets you compare those uh, uh, against each other. So uh, we also include um, in the visualizations, you know, feature importance. So you can see how, you know, if I, if I wanted to look at the different import fields and what score they have for feature importance, how, how useful they are, um, you can do that. There's a, a lot you can do within the, the user interface here. Uh, and I just kind of go back. Once you have that trained model, then you can attach it to our inference pipeline where you're, you're you know, streaming in that data, whether again, you're using an agent out there or you're streaming in a log stash, we can actually add inference and point to the model that we've just created for like new customers that are coming in, or maybe we're rerunning it against our, our data set like a month later to see, and, and it will add a field at the end to say, what is the, what is the potential likelihood of this customer churning? So there's a new customer with their settings. And based on that, we also, give you which features are most indicative uh, that, that set that churn ratio for a feature importance. So you know, number of charges, number of calls is, is some of the bigger indicators of why this customer will likely churn or is more at risk for churning. Again, all available via APIs, but we have the um, user interface to make it very easy to, to build on this workflow. Um, so model inference, you know, you can do through user interface, uh, APIs, um, and it, you know, everybody says, well, how does it compare? You know, how does it compare to known um, open source tools out there? And we've done a number of tests. We've run multiple tests uh, on OpenML benchmarking data sets and, and compared them against a number of open and available data sets. Boy, this one is binary classification, so it's similar to the customer churn. Um, the, we have a whole blog that goes into details about how you know, our, the red dots is kind of where our, you know, we run it three times. Uh, this is with out of the box settings and, and where we've averaged out, um, our models is averaged out compared to what's available. Uh, and, and there's some that we do better with and some that we do not worse with, but we, we did very well in binary classification. The other one that we've, we've benchmarked against is our outlier detection. And this is the DAMI algorithms that are available for us to compare our models against other outlier detection models. Again, if you're interested in understanding the details behind this, we have a whole blog on, you know, benchmarking, you know, what our models in, in machine learning look like compared to what what you're used you know with open available models out there one of the big differences you won't see in this is just the speed because everything in machine or everything that we do in with machine learning in elastic is based on elastic search elastic search is just such a fast uh query engine 
that allows us to build our models so much faster with less resources because we've constructed the data set in a way that that makes it uh, much faster than doing something in like a relational database or or text files uh, or Hadoop or something. We we can actively do this, uh, you know, exponentially faster than 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 many of the the other tools that are out there because of the way that we store and and query the data and it's it's really based on elastic search using a search engine as the back end it makes it much faster now that i've talked to you about like again very high overview there's a lot of details uh that we'd be happy to talk to you about um but I do want to give you a brief overview of Elond, which is our open source Python package for doing all this data set, data science in a, in a notebook. So if you're used to using Jupyter Notebooks, you can use Elond, you know, either you know, plug it in or use Conda to plug, plug it in and be able to, it, it, it's kind of a Python-like uh, or Pandas interface for data that's an Elasticsearch. So basically, we're just doing the same type of pandas command, but instead of PD, you're doing ED. Uh, some of the reasons to do it, if you have large data sets, you know, you're not, you don't want to store those data sets on your your laptop. You want to be able to, you know, access them over on, on some sort of server or, or hosted environment. We can do that. You can even upload the data sets via Elond. Uh, we have webinars around Elond. Um, that, that you can view and be able to do your own prediction. Um, we can actually use e external models. We'll, you can, we'll support sklearn models or xgboost models. Um, and we have you know, demo files and documentation available. Just kind of idea what that looks like. That same exact uh, data set that I did with the calls and customer data, you can actually download yourself um, and we walk you through uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, a Jupyter Notebook example uh, of, of doing that prediction on customer churn for, for, for that telecom data. So it gives you a real good idea of, of what it looks like from a notebook per perspective, if that's what you use. But you can also do a lot, of, you can do all this through our Kibana user interface as well. Um, I think that was, that is it. Very high level, very quick, I know. 